Good day, everyone, and welcome back to another Live with Kevin, another future episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. I am so glad that you're here, super glad to introduce our guest to you in just a few minutes. But before we do that, I want to talk to you uh, who are here with us live. Now, I know some of you are watching this later and not live. Um, so for all of you who are watching later, you can just, in just a second, I'll introduce my guest and we'll go from there. But this will show you why you should join us live some future time, because this is your chance being with us live to interact with my guest and I to be a part of this conversation. While you're here, I want you to imagine that you're joining us for a cup of coffee. So if you were actually joining us around a table for a cup of coffee, if you had a question, you'd ask it. If you had a comment, you'd share it. If you had an idea, you would offer it. Of course you would. That's sort of the natural nature of conversation. And that's what I hope that you will do here. Although here you have to do that by typing. <clears throat> and so what I hope that you will do is if you have those things, you will share them. It will make for a better conversation. It will make for a better podcast. It might even lead you to get specific answers to your questions, which is pretty awesome. Now, in order to do that, you're going to have to use the comment section of whatever social platform you're in. So why don't you just practice that right now by saying hello and telling us where you're located? That way we'll know where you are. That would be great. We'll probably put, we may put you on the screen uh, across the bottom where my name is currently. And uh, we'd love you to do that. Just getting you used to using those fingers to join us in this conversation. Uh, as I mentioned, this will eventually be an episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. So I'm going to now uh, uh, start that, um, start the actual, where we will we'll, we'll make the break. It would be helpful if Kevin could actually talk this morning, uh, where we'll make the break for the podcast to begin. So here's that countdown. I see some people typing in. We'll get those up in a second. Here's the countdown for you, Marissa, in three, two, one. Working with others is part and parcel of working. And sometimes it is harder than we would like it to be. If you would like to have better working relationships with your team, with your colleagues and even have a framework to help you build those relationships, help others build those relationships as well. You are in the right place. Welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast, where we are helping leaders grow personally and professionally to lead more effectively, make a bigger difference for their teams, organizations, and the world. If you are listening to this podcast, you could be with us for future episodes live, get the information sooner, and perhaps even get your specific questions answered. To find out when they're happening and how you can join us, you can join either our Facebook or LinkedIn groups. Just go to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn to do that. Today's episode is brought to you by our Remarkable Master Classes. Pick from 13 important life and leadership skills to become more effective, productive, and confident while overcoming some of a leader's toughest challenges. You can learn more and sign up at Remarkable Masterclass. Dot com. And now I'm going to bring in our guest. Here he is. He's the world traveler and world famous Michael Bungay Stanier. Let me introduce him. He is at the forefront of shaping how organizations around the world make being coach like an essential leadership competency. His book, The Coaching Habit unweirds coaching. That's his words. Um, it is the best-selling coaching book of this century with over a million copies sold and more than 10,000 five-star reviews on Amazon, including one from me. In 2019, he was named the number one thought leader in coaching. He is was the first Canadian coach of the year, has been named a global guru, coaching guru since 2014, and was a Rhodes Scholar. His most recent, recent book, How to Work with Almost Anyone, shows how to build the best possible relationship with key people at work. That's why we're here. Uh, he founded a company called Box of Crayons, a learning and development company that has helped hundreds of organizations transform from advice-driven to curiosity-led. Uh, we determined earlier that Michael was with us for episode 37, 37 or 38 of this podcast a long time ago. And finally, he's back. Uh, Michael, thanks for being here. So glad yeah. to have you. I mean, episode 37 was a disaster. You were terrible, Kevin. You were terrible. And I'm like, okay, I, I've given you 400 episodes to get better. I'm hoping that this is going to be a better conversation than the last one. But anyway, well, it's nice to see As you. a coach, you can <laughs> tell me later how I did or ask me some questions about how I did. We got people we from go. Michigan. We got people from Illinois. People have got their coffee. Yeah. Uh, uh, great to hear of new events. Awesome. So, so listen, um, 
I want you to tell us a little bit more. Like I often ask people this question and I ask not necessarily for you to expand on the biography yeah. as much as to give us context. Right. So like when you were eight, you know, I doubt that you said, I think I want to be a coaching expert. Like I <laughs> doubt if you were thinking that, although yeah. knowing you, you might have been thinking no, about no, writing. The opposite. So, so like, tell me about the journey for context, not to yeah. give us the, the blow by blow, but like, what sort of leads you to this point? It's a great question because it's not entirely clear to me how I ended up at this point. Although there's that wonderful saying, inspiration is when your past suddenly makes sense. When you look back and you can see the, not just the successes, but the failures and the struggles and the kind of serendipitous moments somehow land you in a place where you're like, that's interesting. Um, so if I look back, I can kind of make a narrative about what got me there. But honestly, Kevin, I'm going to say most of the time I've been stumbling blindly into the future, <laughs> coming up to crossroads, going, what's the bravest choice? What's my best guess? Turning left instead of right and then kind of ending up where I was. So, you know, if you think of who I am now, so I'm a man in my mid 50s. Um, I started this training company 20 some years ago, Box of Crayons, which is pretty reasonably successful. I've got nine or 10 books under my belt. I have a smaller company that's more kind of B to C, helping individuals unlock their greatness. Um, so it would seem from the outside, <laughs> I've had some master plan at play, but it hasn't been like that at all. You know, 20 years ago, uh, 22 years ago, um, I was living in Boston and I got there because I'd married a Canadian who I'd met when I went to study in Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. So that was already an interesting twist in the tale because I wasn't expecting to stay living in England, but fell in love with Marcella and so didn't go back to Australia. Um, and uh, we decided we wanted to move somewhere where um, we'd be close to her mum. So we, we ended up in Boston, miserable time in Boston. Um, uh, just I was working in a company, the company was failing, I was failing in the company that was failing, it was a, a mess. Um, we decided, we went to our local pub, uh, had some beer, and we each, my son and I each wrote down the name of three cities that we thought we'd like to live in. On the count of three, we flipped them over, Toronto made both the beer coasters. So we decided to move to Toronto. I got a job as a consultant lined up, but our flight out of Boston uh, to Toronto was on 9-11. So everything changed. The job as a consultant went away and it kind of threw me into having to start my own business. So, you know, that was one of those tipping moments where through luck and stuff, I, I got forced into starting my own business. Um, I spent the, the first two years at least with a business model, which was, <laughs> do you have a pulse and a wallet? And will you hire me? I can and help I you. Yeah, and I don't even need a pulse. If you've got a wallet and we can sort of figure out a way of communicating, maybe I can help because, you know, I had a, a miscellaneous grab bag of skills. I could facilitate. I knew a bit about strategy. I knew about a bit about change management and how that worked. I was starting to learn about coaching and how that was working. I had this mis miscellany of, of experience. And doing all these little things, this is what... Um, good to great guy would say firing I was firing bullets to try and figure out the target what became clear was coaching in organizations was something that I thought was being taught really badly I had a strong opinion about how it could be taught better and I thought there might be money to be made around there in other words it could be sold so there's a need there's some passion on my side or some at least some interest and there's a business need in the market so that is the magic threesome you need to start a business. Um, and so I started teaching coaching skills for managers and leaders in a way that felt more, it, that more respectful to actually the busy lives of managers and leaders. And that turned into the coaching habit book after five or six years of teaching that, which kind of has become this, you know, a huge success as, of a book. Um, and that, help box of crayons launch and kind of carried on from there. So, but before that, you know, as a, as a 17 year old, um, I was, uh, in my first year at university, maybe I was 18 at this stage. And, uh, a, f a friend of mine, I, I had spent 
quite a lot of time talking to my angsty teenage friends about their angsty teenage lives because that's what you do as a teenager. And I realized I was pretty good at listening, but also that I had no real idea what I was doing. I wasn't sure whether this was helping. I wasn't sure whether I was moving things along or just keeping us stuck in a the perpetual conversation about, you know, teenage love. Um, so I did some early training as uh, for crisis telephone counseling, suicide, actually, sui youth suicide telephone counseling. So it was actually at 18, I did my first learning about what it meant to listen, what it meant to ask a question, be quiet, what it meant to understand that their answer might not be their first, the best answer and the only answer, but to be curious about what was behind the first answer. And that's really where the seed got planted. So underlying all of this, you know, I'm Australian. I uh, did uh, literature and law at university. I finished law school being sued by one of my law professors for defamation. So that wasn't going well. And luckily, I won the Rhodes Scholarship that took me you to... You get out of Dodge. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because otherwise, I would have probably ended up being a really unhappy lawyer for a while. And unhappy and not very good, incompetent, perhaps, lawyer. Um, so I feel like I've had a series of lucky breaks right back to the moment when I was 14 and a teacher at school, high school asked me, well, what do you want to do after high school? And I had, I had no idea. I hadn't even realized there was an after high school. I'm only 14, but I went, I said, well, I probably want to go to Oxford because my dad who is English went to Oxford University. He grew up in Oxford, actually. And so he, as a local boy, he went to Oxford University. And Mr. Lennox, the Latin teacher, said, well, he sort of laughed, well, you'll, you'll need to be a Rhodes Scholar to do that. So, you know, even that moment, which planted the seed of being a Rhodes Scholar, which I actually, you know, 10 years later or 11 years later became, there's just been all these little moments where I've been bumped this way instead of that way, which has turned into a, a life that I just think is a, a, a wonderful life. So uh, to, to get us back to this or move us forward, not, not get us back, but move us toward this book. So yeah. I, I think that most people who are watching, listening, know you in relationship to coaching. I mean, that yeah. was in the intro. It's, we've just talked about it some more. Gives people some background of that, which is awesome. And, and, yet, and you've written a book since The Coaching Habit about goals, which I think people can say, okay, well, that kind of makes sense as yeah. it relates to coaching. But now this, is, this new book is How to Work with Almost Anyone. We could talk about the almost part. But um, <laughs> why this book? It, and I want to get into the book. Yeah. But real quickly, like, what's the con is this just the next nudging and bumping? Or is there something more connective here that you want to share with us? Well, I, you know, I've written two books that are kind of connected around the coaching in particular, the coaching habit, and then the sister book to that is called The Advice Trap. Right. Um, and I think of this book as a third book in that trilogy, because they, all three of them are about a human interaction at work that's quite difficult. You know, it is, it is easy to explain, but difficult to do to be more coach-like, because it's, can you stay curious a little bit longer? Can you rush to action and advice giving a little bit more slowly? I can tell you that in a sentence, but actually you have to shift some deep behaviors to build the discipline to stay curious a little bit longer. And just as those first two books, unweird uh, coaching, I think what this book might do is unweird psychological safety. So it's been, what, 10 or 15 years since Amy Edmondson really taught us and gave us that language. And since then, it's become just embedded in organizational language around, you know, uh, psychological safety really matters. It allows people to show up, helps teams be more effective, allows people to feel seen and feel feel heard. But if you say to people, hey, so how do you do? Like, sorry about my friend's dog, Hardy. There's a fox out there and we're just... Obviously not as psychologically safe in the kitchen here as I was hoping. No problem. Um, I'm people. I mean, it comes down to this, Kevin. I want people to work well together at work. I want people to have the best chance of building what I would call adult to adult relationships at work. Not just for the quality of work that gets done, but for the um, the sense of being a human at work you know and i know this is exactly what you do with your work with wayne as well which is like how do we get the work done so, sorry about hardy um hardy and how do we get the work done and how do we also stay human while we do the work and 
our work happens through people. The quality of our working life is so driven by the quality of our working relationships. But most of the time, Kevin, we cross our fingers and we hope for the best. You know, like, oh, let's just see how it plays out. And, well, and we know that sometimes it's hard and, okay, that's just the way it has to yeah. be. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it sucks. Sometimes it's great. And you just kind of, it, it feels like you're rolling the dice. And what I want is for people to feel they've got a little more agency in shaping the relationships that they've got. So they have the chance of building the best possible relationships with the people that matter to them. Not every relationship is going to be perfect. But if even if you can build the best relationship with that person and move it from a four out of 10 to a six out of 10, that is huge in terms of just livability and workability and happiness and contentment. Yeah, I love that. And, and that's the frame of the book in many ways is how do we, what, what does this mean? What, what are these, what are the relationships here that we most want to work on and focus yeah. on and all of that. And, and the book, helps us take, takes us through a lot of that. And we'll, we'll get to some of that. Um, but I, can, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Just to tell you, so you have a really interesting working ship with Wayne, you know, you've co-written a series of books with him. I bought his company. You bought his company. <laughs> Helpful as well. Um, I'm curious to know what do you think has been the secret to your success of that working relationship? Because that's a hard thing to do, to work and co-work and buy somebody's business and find a way of working well together. How have you figured out how to work well together, the two of you? Well, I think that um, uh, one, of the one of the things I'll start by saying, and, and, and you know us well enough to know that we're very different. That's right. Like, we're very different. And, um, and I think that part of it is that we value the differences. Uh, and I think a big part of it is that we... We recognize how we can bring, how we can complement each other well, right? right? So, so we we got to know each other first, kind of in this kind of a mode, right? He yeah. had a podcast back before podcasts were cool. I was on it. We got to know each other right. in that kind of context. But I, I think that early on we recognized that we both had something useful to bring to something that we could come together, yeah. and um, and so we were peers and we continue to be peers in some ways and yet in other ways I write his paycheck and there's there's all of that piece of it right but for all of us on this uh, listening to this watching this that's true too right if you're a leader you could be thinking about this conversation yeah. um with the people that you lead with your your peer group as well right and, and I sort of said that in the open that's and I think right. both of them matter and I and I think that in some cases it's the same in some cases it's not, but, but I think, I think the biggest thing for us is that we've, we've really learned to value each other's differences and because it's almost always been at a distance, right. That we've had to work at it from that perspective as well. So Kevin, what's brilliant about that is this recognition that it's in your differences that your strengths lie. Like if you, if, if Kevin was just like, if Wayne was just like Kevin, there's less value in building a partnership with him. Cause you're like, I'm just hiring a version of myself. But with difference comes conflict because you see the world differently. You have different priorities. You perhaps work in different ways. And I'm curious to know what you've learned around managing conflict or at least those moments where there's kind of a little tear in the fabric between the two of you as you work, assuming that that's happening. One of the things that, you know, so, so if you go into the details of writing a book together, which we've done three times, and now we're, we're going to be doing a second edition of long distance leader. So we'll be doing it again. Um, and the, one of the things I learned from Wayne early on is we would like, like our writing styles are also quite different. And yet, like, if you read a book Rain, Wayne wrote and you read a book that Kevin wrote, you'll say they're different than this one. And yet in this book, you don't read, even though initial chapters, some are initial chapter written by Wayne and some by Kevin, like you just have to do something right to divide the work. Um, when we're putting it together and when we're creating this common voice, one of the things, one of the things that Wayne often says, well, well, here's how I feel, but that's not a hill to die on. And so that's become one of those things for us is like, we can share our opinions and we can say, Hey, this one's really important to me or this one, not as much. Right. I want you to hear it. And then we can move past it. And, and that's been, that one phrase has been very helpful for the two of us. 
So here's what's brilliant is in, in that story, there's an embodiment about what this whole book is about, trying to give people a language to navigate the relationship together. So you've got a phrase, this is not a hill to die on, where you go, look, there's, we're going to have disagreements, we're going to have different points of view. You have an understanding between what, what is Kevin standing for? And he's like, that's non-negotiable. And what does Kevin just feel about but could negotiate around? And it means that the two of you have agreed on a way of working before you got into the how we write the book. <laughs> yeah. And that's the, the key kind of insight from this new book, How to Work with Almost Anyone, which is how do you have a conversation about how you work together before you plunge into the work? And the thing is, the work always feels important. <laughs> it always feels like it's a thing to get into. Like when you and Wayne sit down and go, right, we're on to the second edition of the book, the temptation is just to talk about the book because it's like, I've got these ideas and we should expand this chapter and drop this chapter and interview this person and, and you know, add this update on AI and chat GPT and whatever. It's so easy. And this is what happens to all of us to get pulled into the shiny, loud, bright, urgent, critical kind of work that needs to be done. But what's helping you and Wayne work together so well is you've got an understanding about how you work, not just what you're working on. So so this is an interesting observation. And this is exactly, by the way, how I thought this conversation would go, which is different than almost every conversation <laughs> that we have on this podcast, which is awesome. Uh, we are talking with Michael bungay here, or otherwise known as MBS, uh, the author of the brand new book, How to Work with Almost Anyone. Uh, so this morning. Oh, Michael, wait. Kevin, I'm going to interrupt. So I'm just thinking about MBS, and then I was, in my head I went KE for Kevin. But then I'm thinking about Wayne, which is WT, right? Yeah. So the two of you together spell cute. Okay, awesome. Well, I could go all day without have heard that. I'll say, and I'm sure Wayne will as well. I'll make sure that that will come up when the team re reviews this, and someone on the team might be watching now. I don't know. Anyway, so um, – yeah, I, I don't know how. Sorry, I'm, gonna, sorry, I'm not sure I'm going to unhear that one. But anyway, this morning I was writing. So we're uh, we're in the process of celebrating the start of 30 years in business. So we're a little bit ahead of you in that. And Congratulations! So, That's amazing. Yeah, 30 years. It shows dog-headed persistence is what it shows, Michael. Well, it shows um, more than that. It's like very rare for an organization to last 30 years. So full congratulations for that. Well, thank you. So. This morning, I was writing what will be an article in our newsletter tomorrow on our blog tomorrow uh, about um, I, I decided to write a list or make a list of five books that have impacted me on my leadership journey. And I could have, like you, I could have listed 50 books and I could have written books that every leader ought to read. But I didn't want to do that because everyone's done that list. So I made this list and there are books on it that you've probably read and there are books on it that people may have never heard of. And all that's fine. But one of the things that I didn't really have a book in content wise, but um, you mentioned this phrase earlier. And I could have put a book in in this in the area of because I've read a ton about facilitation mm. and facilitation to me is about, I mean, the word facile is inside of facilitate, which is yeah. to make easier. Right. And so if we want to make conversations easier, if we want to make leadership easier, if we want to make engagement easier, if we want to make relationships easier, mm -hmm. we have to think about the process. So a long way to get back to the point you were making is that in order for, uh, if we just go into the content, we just go to the task, the urgent, the thing, the shiny object, right. the project, the, the next step, all that. If we just go to the content and forget about the process, we know it won't go as well. And so mm -hmm. I think that one of the things that I've sort of absorbed over a long time is, and, and you are an expert at this, is this idea of we have to think about the process of right. what we're trying to accomplish and not just what we're accomplishing. Yeah. I, and in fact, uh, it's been a flash of the bleedingly obvious for me. As I look back over the books I've written over the years, they're, they're all process driven in a way that I think is not that common. Most ideas are, here's my big idea of the book. Um, whereas for me, I'm like, I want the, the least possible in terms of content and the most possible in mechanism. So people can go, I can make progress on this, you know, coaching habit. Here are the seven questions and here's how to ask them, you know, the, how, how to begin. Here's how you 
take the journey to set a worthy goal for yourself, something thrilling, important, and daunting. For this, it's like, here's a keystone conversation. And here are the five questions behind a keystone conversation. And it, the, what's, what's interesting about it, I think, Kevin, is also that when you understand process, it actually gives you a more subtle level of control about what's going on. Because when people are, are entangled in the content, if you can be the person who facilitates, who makes it easy, who sees the arc and helps people get to the finish line, there's a way that you can get disentangled from the yes, no of content and more into the how do I get this group across the finish line? And that is what becomes strategic. Content is often tactics, yes or no. Strategy is how do we get to the place we need to get to for this to be the, have the most impact. Right. Yeah, I love that. And and so we probably should talk about the book a little bit. You mentioned the five questions. Um, I well, have them all that I can put in. Tell us what the five books are that you put on your the five most impactful books for you because I have some of them in front of me. So yeah. I have a Tom Peters book that was not that was not one of his most famous. Uh, the Circle of Innovation by Tom Peters. Oh, I don't even even know that one. Wayne Wayne Berger, a more beautiful question. That is great. Yeah, uh, um, is that Wayne or Hal? Isn't it Hal Berger? No, it's Warren Warren. Warren Berger. Berger. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, Warren. Yeah, a um, wonderful book. That is a. I, I really had um, the question uh, QBQ. Oh uh, yes. Question yeah. before the question by yeah. John Miller. And now, of course, you're putting me on the spot, and I'm not going to remember the other two I, I, in this. I case. think three out of five. That is a, and, um, <laughs> oh, flow. flow was another one. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, perfect. Had, so, had and I also tried like, to pick books. Hey, chick, miss, chick sent me hey. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Um, I also try to pick books that in some cases people might not know, like, or maybe they know, maybe they don't. Oh, and then the fifth one was the, the, um, the uh, Outward Mindset by oh, the yes. Street. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, that's a really interesting choice. So, um, I, and I try. I picked things that I thought ha have had a have had an impact on the way I think, and in a couple of cases, I think put language to what I already thought and believed. Mm -hmm. But and, and you know, I don't know about how do you feel about this. Sometimes you read a book and think, man, I kind of wish I wrote wrote that book. No. Oh. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm I'm always irritated when I read a book. I. I the, the Heath brothers, when they wrote Switch on that book on change, I was like, damn you. <laughs> I was like, oh, I, I could see how I could have written that book. And I wish I had written it, but I don't think I could have written a book the way I don't think it would have been as good as, right. as this book. And so, yeah, when I say that, I'm not saying I could have written it as well or better, but yeah. just the concept the two, behind the it. The two books for me, I love types of books. One is when they give shape to what I already knew where I'm like, oh, wow, that just takes a whole bunch of swirling mess in my head and condenses it into a way that is articulated and the like. And then the second book is where I'm like, I did not know that. <laughs> You've just opened up a whole new totally. world for me that explains things like I, I never did. Um, I remember the first time I read a book on complexity. Um, what was that famous book? by The, uh, the first book on complexity by... Uh, Oh my goodness, I've gotten a name. Um, in any case, I just remember reading and just going, oh my goodness. <laughs> well, the book by D. Hawk around complexity yep. and, and founding Visa, and yep. just going, Excellent book. none of the none of this book I even I I just knew none of this. <laughs> right. This <laughs> is like totally well. new stuff. I'll tell you a book that almost made my list. It's sitting right here because I'm using it in some work I'm doing. Do you know this book? The Age of Paradox by Charles Handy. I don't know this that. This is not a new book either. This is like, yeah. I don't know. This is old. 1994. Wow, that's there great. You go. Um, hey, you know, this I, is I, this has not been a conversation about your book. We've been talking about all kinds of other stuff, which is exactly what I knew would happen. But I do want before we kind of go into the 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 back back yeah. corner of this conversation, um, I do want you to just tell people the five questions because sure. we could talk about, you know, the, the book is about the idea of how do we create these, these best possible relationships. And right. the foundation of it is what's called the Keystone conversation, yeah. which is That's about cool. these five questions. So can you just, sure. I'll put them up on the screen, just go yeah, through really. the five questions. So people have a concept. 
while they're waiting to get their copy, which they're going to want to get. <laughs> Thank Go you. Ahead. The subliminal message there, buy a copy if you wouldn't mind, please. So yeah, so key idea, best possible relationship, a relationship that is safe and vital and repairable. The key tactic, a keystone conversation, a conversation about how we work together before we plunge into the work. And then there are five suggested questions for the keystone conversation. You don't really have to ask all five, but all five of them are useful. The first is the amplify question, and that is, what's your best? What's your best? Um, not what are you good at, not what are your values, not what are your strengths, but what's your best? And what it's asking is when do you shine and when do you flow? Just to go back to your reference to flow and hey, Chip sent me hey. It's like when do you shine and when do you flow? What a gift if you're trying to go, let me tell you about who I am, to tell somebody when you shine and when you flow. The second question is the steady question. And the steady question is, it's kind of about the mechanics of how you work. And I ask it like this, what are your practices and preferences? Because we all have our common sense ways of working, but they're all slightly weird and quirky and idiosyncratic and individualistic. So it's really helpful just to explain, here's my preferences around how a bunch of stuff works. As a really tactical example, I use Asana as a way of managing my to-do list and my projects. And I have an assistant, luckily enough, Claudine. And um, I've got some quirky things about my to-dos. I like them to start with a capital letter and I like them to start with a verb, a doing word. Because how can you do a to-do if it doesn't have a doing word in them? David Allen from Getting Things Done taught me that. And I just had that conversation with Claudine right at the start. And so she doesn't do a little thing that in an outsized way would irritate me if she gave me tasks and if they weren't formatted properly. So that's the steady question. The third question and the fourth question are, are related. So before you go to those, let me just say yeah. that based on our conversations so far, for everyone who's paying attention, hopefully, uh, is that they're both process questions. Right. They're both process questions. Exactly. Go ahead. The third and the fourth question are related. So the third question is the good date question. And the fourth question, if you can flick that up, is the bad date question. And so let me show you how these two work together. They share a common insight, which is patterns from our past will repeat again in our future. So get clear on what the patterns are from your past. That's helpful for you to know and helpful for the other person to know. And then have a conversation about them. So the good date question is, what can we learn from past successful relationships? And the bad day question is, what can we learn from past frustrating relationships? So imagine, Kevin, if you and Wayne had sat down before you wrote any of your books and you went, let's have a conversation where I tell you when I've really successfully collaborated with somebody, co-created something, and it was great. And let me tell you the time I tried to co-create something with somebody and it kind of sucked or just failed or just was a bit miserable. And Wayne did the same. That would be priceless conversation around, well, okay, so we need to do this and we need to really do this and we need to not do this. And then the fifth and final question is the repair question. And the repair question is, how will we fix it when things go wrong? And the power in this, Kevin, is it says things will go wrong. <laughs> it just acknowledges. It acknowledges the fact. It's, yep. it's, it's inevitable. Um, you know, there's going to sometimes, I mean, sometimes it's dramatic, you know, shouting and melodrama and kind of Sicilian feuds that last for 40 years, but mostly it's more, you know, mistakes, misspoken, misunderstood. Somebody didn't have breakfast. Somebody slept badly. You know, everybody's under resourced in a way and something happens that kind of rips the fabric a little bit. And you know, as part of the research around this book, I read all these brilliant relationship writers like Esther Perel and Terry Reel and Dan Siegel. And across all of them, there's this kind of two-part insight. Part one, the relationships that flourish are the ones that get repaired. And part two, most of us suck at repairing relationships. So if you can more actively be the one who says, hey, how do we fix it when things go wrong? you have a better chance of creating a relationship that is healthier and has more length and life to it. I'll just add, add one comment and I'll take your, take your thoughts on this as well as it, as I was listening to you talk just now about the repair piece. Uh, 
when, when you think about when when you go into the realm of customer service and you hear you talk about customer service recovery and what yeah. we often have found and all of us have in our own experience is that sometimes our best feelings about a vendor are when it's been screwed up and then it's the, exactly. after the recovery or yeah. in this case after the repair it actually makes it stronger and that's much stronger me, you're, you're 10 times more likely to to refer a company and talk about them in positive ways if they've screwed up and then done a stellar job at fixing the screw up um than if they'd done no screw up in the first place i mean and i think there's a, there's there's connection to what you're saying here about i think i think there is too which is like if you screw up and you repair, actually you you not only get back to where you were, but you probably go a little further because you both made a statement of intent around this is valuable enough for both of us to be brave enough to have that conversation to talk about what went wrong and to try and fix it in some way. So before we before we go into the final turn in this conversation, I just want to make an observation to all of you in real time uh, that. Michael started by saying that he, he wanted to help people figure out how to be more curiosity led than advice driven. And if you listen to this conversation, reflect back on what you've listened to or go back and listen again, you will find that the man lives exactly <laughs> what he what he teaches. And so that to me Thanks, is a Kevin. powerful model. And, and and I love that. It's one of the many things that I appreciate about you, my friend. Right. Um my, my key takeaway from this so far is that the anagram of you and Wayne's initials is cute. That That's that's the big win. The rest of it is just miscellaneous. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, of all the things. All you the things. That's the thing you pick. Okay. So, um, so my friend, other than finding strange connections in, in the, in uh, people's initials, yeah. my question to you is what do you do for fun? Well, what I, um, and I, one small thing I do for fun is I play the ukulele badly. Um, I play tennis badly. I play soccer slightly less badly, but still pretty badly. But most of what I try and do is I hang out with my wife. And I, actually, I've been in Australia for the last two months helping my mum move out of the family home into a into a elder village support place. And uh, now in, in London. So I haven't seen my wife much for the last three months. So going home and hanging out and hanging out just doing a jigsaw with Marcella is going to be my number one, how to have fun in the moment. I can only do jigsaw puzzles in the winter. I just have this problem with not doing them when, when doing them when it's nice outside. But anyway, um, there you have it. So I know that you are a reader. It's very clear, for, even just from this conversation, if you just met Michael. So what's something you're reading now or have read recently, Michael? I've got three books that um, I've got four books actually that are on the go at the moment: uh, two fiction, two two nonfiction. The two nonfiction books I've just started. Um, one is Amy Evanson's uh, new book, a Right Kind of Wrong. So this is her next iteration into psychological safety. So it's got a really strong connection to how to work with almost anyone. And then um, Shane Parrish, who runs the Farnham Street blog and the Clear Thinking podcast, has a book called Clear Thinking Out, which is about the discipline of thinking more clearly. I think it's got a chance of becoming the new atomic habits. So those are two nonfiction books I can recommend. The fiction books I'm reading is um, Emily Watson's translation of the Iliad, which I've just started, but it's fantastic so far. It's <laughs> she writes in a way that removes all the normal highfalutin language that comes when people translate Homer, and it just feels like a it's almost like a soap opera. Um, it's really wonderful. And then a British author uh, who is an academic who writes about the poet John Donne, but also writes young adult novels on the side, and they are brilliant. Her new book is called Imaginary Creatures, and her name is Catherine Blundell. And, um, you know, I picked that book up yesterday, and, I, and I'm kind of desperate for this podcast to end so I can go back and read it, because it's one of those books where I'm like, you just want to read it all in a single setting, because it's, it's brilliant. Well, we'll have links to all of those as well as Michael's new book, How to Work with Almost Anyone, in the show notes. And I hope that you'll take advantage of those. Uh, Michael, where do you want to point people? Where can they learn more? Yeah, bestpossiblerelationship.com is the best place for support around the new book. 
not only can you download the five questions, but you can actually see me in a video having a keystone conversation. So if you're like, yeah, but what does it look like in reality? That will show you exactly what it looks like. And then more generally, my website is mbs.work. So that's where you go for all of the free resources connected to all of the books that I've written. mbsworks.com and best. Oh, no, it's just mbs.works. There's no, no. Dot com. Yes, right. And I'm, yeah. I, I, yes, thank you. mbs.works. And I was thinking ahead and best possible relationships. Ship, singular, right. but ships as well will get you there. Best possible relationship.com. Dot com. And now a question for all of you before we close this out and Michael can get back to his book. <laughs> um, the question that I have for you, I ask you every single episode. It is now what? What action are you going to take as a result of this conversation? There's plenty of things that you might, like if you didn't get an idea for a new book to read from this episode, I don't know what it might be. <laughs> new book, old book, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but there's more than that. There's, there's, all sorts of ideas that you might have taken about the questions that you might ask about which working relationships you need to work on about how you might work to repair a relationship that you're in and the, and the ways that you can go about it. We talked about a number of things today that hopefully you found entertaining, but that's not really why this podcast exists. This podcast is just exists to help you be a more effective leader, make a bigger positive difference in the world. And, and so unless you take action, it won't have met, met its goal. So, uh, Michael, thank you so much for being here. I've been looking forward to it. I'm kind of glad that we had the chance to wait till the book's been out a while and breathe yeah, yeah. before we got the chance to do this. this um, thanks so thanks much for Kevin. Here. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. And so, everybody, if you like this and you already join us regularly, invite someone else to join us mm. or write a review for someone. And if you're watching or listening for the first time, make sure you go to remarkablepodcast.com or wherever you find your podcast to join us next week, because next week there will be another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast.